our app, uh, as well as go onto our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, there'll be a link in the next couple of days in our uh, church page on how to do that. Just real quickly, I want to share some announcements with you. We are going to do our uh, community service project on Friday. Uh, looks like the weather's moving in tomorrow and should be out early Friday morning. So we're going to play it by ear right now. The plan is to meet here at 8 and go work, and it'll be an all-day uh, project. We're going to see how the weather goes, so we'll keep up with everybody. We may have to delay the start an hour, maybe two, um, before we get started, depending on when the front moves out. But it's nothing that is going to affect us with the wet weather as far as the ground being wet. We just don't want all of it folks to get wet since we're going to be working out there all day. But I thank you in advance for allowing your young people and those of you who are adults that are going to help us with that. This is going to be a great project and we're looking forward to doing it. Also, just a reminder about our Run for Hope, um, the orphanages that we're helping. Some of our young people are running in that race, so you may ask some of them. They're looking for sponsors. Uh, also, our Women's Conference is coming, and most of you have registered. If not, I think there is still time to do that. We should have some uh, prayer regions for you, or some much smaller sections on our 13-mile block map for you Sunday to collect, and it'll be a much smaller block with all the streets listed in that block, and you can just see it on the map, be able to cover those street streets and just check that off and let us know when you're done. We'll give you more information on that on Sunday to try to get that uh, completed between now and Easter. Uh, YWA project is still going on and it'll we'll receive funds on that until the end of May. And also be mindful of the shower we're going to have for uh, Zach and Sh uh, Shelby. And that'll be March 31st, the last Sunday of this month at 3 p.m. Also, as part of our ministry training classes, uh, we're working on getting everybody in a uh, communication uh, group. And so you may have gotten multiple messages today, so bear with us, we're working through that. I just want to make sure that everybody got it in some way, form, or fashion. And uh, we're going to meet the fourth Sunday of every month. So we won't meet the 31st. We'll actually meet the 24th of this week. So, you ready for the good word of God tonight? Amen. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13 again. We're going to look at, uh, just really quickly, the first few verses that we looked at last week. The first three, and then we started in four. We'll pick back up in four tonight. But I'll recap that. I'm going to read that to you in just a minute. But just an overview of this chapter again. This is Paul addressing a church who has lost focus. Love, uh, like the church of Laodicea, they've lost their first love. They've kind of grown lukewarm and some things have taken the place of love. And, uh, Paul reminds us at the end of the chapter, which was our first lesson, that these three things are going to remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And so we want to make sure that whatever we do, that keeps the precedent and who we are, that love begins to flow in us. And, and as we, God loves us and we pour out our love to Him, we're able to pour that into other relationships that we have. And that's really the foundation we've been trying to have in our own lives and in our church for the last few weeks, just making sure that everything looks that way, couldn't end up against that magnifying glass. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's what love is what hung Jesus on that cross. Amen. And so we want to look at this chapter as a reminder of our own lives, our own relationships that we have, and our own church. Again, Paul is addressing something, not in a bad way when I read these first verses here. If you were here last week, you'll know that. Paul certainly believes in gifts. In 12, he says, do not forbid gifts in your church or tongues in your church. He believes in all these gifts, but they've taken a place of indulgence. They've taken a place that is greater than the love of Christ. And Paul is just trying to get this church back on track. So let's look at the first three verses again, and then we'll go back into um, four. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love for others growing out of God's love of me, then I have become only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, just an annoying distraction. And if I have the gift of prophecy and speak a new message from God to the people and understanding all mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have all sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, 
but do not have love reaching out to others. I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it does no good at all. And so we talked about this last week, that Paul is just kind of allowing this church, just as much like Jesus did with the Sermon on the Mount, what they think is important. He's explaining to them, if I do all of these things, and I do all these things with excellence, and these great, good, powerful gifts that God has given us that are effective and that are for the edifying and the healing and the equipping of the body, unless I've got love, then all of that becomes counterproductive and all of that becomes useless. The foundation is not built on what it should be. And the motivation that we're using those gifts for and the motivation that we're doing it have become self-serving and not agape love, which he is talking about. Now in uh, verse 4, he begins to explain what agape love is, true love, the unconditional love that Jesus had for us, that God had for us. So let's begin with 4. We're going to look at Amplified tonight. Love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful and is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. So let's just start where we looked at last week about enduring with patience and serenity or patience and peace. How many of you know that it's easy to lose our patience? It's easy to, to become frustrated and, and, and get to with someone where you're being ineffective. If you're not careful, your, your frustration leads to anger, which gives the place to the enemy. And, and you can have a holy righteousness. We know that. Jesus turned over those tables. He took a whip in there and handled business in his father's house. But I think we use that too often. And I think we use that too loosely, if we're honest. Because as we settle back down after we've had a time of impatience, especially with our children, and we sit back down and we try to work through that, the times that I find I'm much more effective is that I don't let it get to that point. That I'm allowing myself to discipline in love with, with Hunter, that if I discipline incrementally and periodically, it is much better than allowing it to get to a point where I'm ineffective, he's ineffective, and he doesn't receive it. And so that patient endurance is what Paul is talking about here. This love that surpasses all understanding, that wants us to be long-suffering, and not through uh, just through trials and tribulations that this love endures in us, and that is how we take trials and tribulations but that we have that patience with others. We have that patience in our marriage. Also that this other, well, another word for this is really a long-suffering word. Or that we suffer long with someone. That we're kind and we're thoughtful. And we're welcoming. That's the second part of this. That we are kind to others. We're kind and we show kindness when we have the opportunity. And also the, the love that is in us propels us or enables us to show kindness. And it's amazing what kindness does. When you show kindness to someone, especially to someone that may not deserve it or is not used to it, it has an effect on them. Now, it angers some who are very broken and very hurt. I have been kind to some, and that just make them uh, that much matter. The Bible talks about if we give a cup of cold water in our names or enemies, it's like you've been burning coals on their heads. And sometimes it goes down that way. But again, if our hearts are pure, then we know we're doing all we can do. We're doing all we can do to manage this situation, to, to allow this relationship to continue or to not be part of the problem. It's easy to become part of the problem. I tend to meet aggression with aggression unless I'm really focusing on the Lord and focusing on the Holy Spirit to keep me where He desires for me to be. And it is not jealous. This kind of love is not envious or jealous. And we know that this is a really hard thing to keep out of our culture and a faith family and unity in the church. Uh, the enemy uh, became jealous of God. Satan himself became jealous of the praise and worship of God. So he knows how to, to take this and, and work on our flesh to get us jealous of one another and jealous of other giftings. And again, when love is not the foundation and love is not put up above everything else and we're looking at obeying the law like the Pharisees or we're looking at operating in gifts as this church was, whatever that might be, then there is a, there, there's the haves and there's the have-nots. We're not looking at each other that we're equally loved, which we are. God loves us all. 
And therefore, we all can look with equality and have no jealousy over how much God loves each of us. But when the precedence is giftings and, and possessions or whatever it may be, then all of a sudden this hierarchy presents itself that the cross took care of, and then that jealousy begins to creep back in. So we've got to combat that culture from within our own hearts first, and we've also got to teach the ones that we have influence over like our little ones, to, to seek love first and realize that if we are envious of somebody, and it's hard not to with social media, you know, uh, how many of you are frustrated because Facebook's broke today? I, I will raise my hand because I'm used to using it to promote uh, the services and other things, but all, most of us know Facebook is primarily used to promote us, right? I mean, it's a platform. It's a, when the selfie is the most taken picture of all pictures, we live in a self centered society and again this is not to make you feel guilty tonight it's just for us to examine our hearts and realize that if we are headed down a path where we need more lights to feel value instead of going to our prayer closet and getting value from the Lord then we're, we're setting ourselves up for emptiness we're setting ourselves up for the next like and the next applause or the next kind word or the next compliment and the next thing you know, nothing is ever enough because it is a counterfeit. It's not God's love. It's not His confidence that He can place in us. And that's the kind of love that we have to have. And then once we do that and we lay that foundation, status doesn't have a place in a heart that's full of secure and love and a faith family that's that way. And love doesn't brag. It's not self-promoting. It doesn't parade itself. It's not boastful. And those are things that we have to work on. If we're not careful, we want to do that. And we do celebrate each other in here. And that's what we should do. Uh, Paul also talked about in the, in the letter to the Philippians. Whatever is good, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is worth celebrating, is celebrate it. But when we become arrogant and we become those things that are counterproductive, a lot of times people who are that way, who present themselves that way, are really in security now. They're trying to tell you how good they are as much as they're trying to tell themselves. And how do I know this? Because I used to be one of those people that really didn't have a lot of confidence, that really felt I needed to create uh, a facade or an air about me for people to like and love me. I didn't feel like I was enough on my own. And guess what? I wasn't at that time because I was not a believer. I didn't have God in my heart. I needed those people to like me and feel that they love me. And so when you do that, then you're then you're setting yourself up to exaggerate and, and to promote yourself in a light that is probably not true. And those things get you self-emptying on the inside. And when you get alone and by yourself, it's just detrimental to who you are. The same way can happen to a faith family and a, a body of believers if we're too much self-promoting, if we want our church be promoted over other bodies of believers or over other things and we start saying our church is the best in the city and come to our church, my pastor's the bestest and the mostest and our praise team rocks, aren't you jealous? I mean, have you heard those things said? I've seen those things on social media. You know, be jealous. And when we're out vacationing, what's the number one thing that people say to me? I'm so jealous. And if we're not careful, we're feeding that process. And I'm not saying you shouldn't celebrate your trips. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. But I'm saying that we're just allowing this culture to come in where we shouldn't be jealous of one another. We should celebrate one another. We should be happy for one another. We should be comfortable enough in who we are in God to be able to create this culture where we're helping each other up instead of tearing each other down. And there's a difference. And it grieves the Holy Spirit when, when we're arrogant instead of confident. It's one thing to be confident. Jesus was confident, and that caused enough turmoil in and of itself. You can be confident in the Lord and face a lot of criticism and face a lot of things that are happening. But God knows the difference between arrogant and confident. And as you pray and you talk to Him about this, He's going to help you understand that. And a lot of times with spiritual gifts, if we're not careful, it's easy to become... Uh, elevated and, and, and excited and even arrogant about God using you for a spiritual gift. I mean, how how not? You laid our hands on somebody and God used you as a part of the process of their healing or or He gave you a word to speak to somebody that you know you didn't know on your own but He gave it to you. But if you're not careful, your gift will begin identifying you and you you rise and fall by your gift or your calling rather than who you are in God. And that's the enemy's just little subtle way to get in and make these gifts confusing, 
make, make an environment where, where when God doesn't do it, we're going to try to do it ourselves. And it's so easy to, for that to happen. But the way that doesn't happen is staying in prayer with Him. And having good people in your life that love you, that will help you along the way, that you know love you and they have the best for you and they think best about you to say, hey, if you see something in my life, I've had this issue before, so I know that there's an opportunity for the enemy to try to creep in. Could you just help me with this? And I had someone early on, I wanted to see God heal people. I wanted to pray and see them saved, healed, and delivered. And so we would do all these outreaches out in the city and go and do these things. And someone who was much older and seasoned than me pulled me aside one night and said to me, I can tell when you're praying and when the Holy Spirit is praying through you, and about the time God gets ready to do something, y'all are jockeying and fighting for position. And I got very angry when they said that and very offended. But I went home and I prayed about it. And sure enough, that was true. Because I wanted to have credit to be the one that was praying for that person and then receive their healing or their deliverance. I wanted my ministry to grow. I wanted, I wanted to do great things for God, but I wanted to be known as someone who did that. Does that make sense to everybody in here? And that little subtle thing was keeping God from doing exactly what He wanted to do. But He loved me enough, and I was grieved over the people that I haven't seen that happen because I was getting in the way. And so He gave me a great analogy that I tried to keep that way when we talk about gifts and operating in gifts, that I'm just the two. You know, if He can use a donkey, He can use me. I say that a lot to remind myself. But if I just try to keep all the things out of the way where He can flow through me. That way he gets all the credit and all the glory and the honor. And I'm so thankful to have someone in my life that would speak that. And, and as we begin to do that, we're able to see that and see that happen. Because I want this to be a church where God does miracles among us. And he, he's able to do that because we're able to have humility and we're able to celebrate each other and the things that he's going to do. And there is a difference in that, as I said before. And the grieving of the Holy Spirit in us is something that we experience. You should know what that feels like because we all do things that are displeasing to the Lord. Whether we want to admit that or not, there are thoughts that we have, there's times that we get frustrated or we don't love like we're talking about tonight, and we grieve the Holy Spirit because He desires for us to do better. Just like a father is disappointed in us, God is disappointed in something we did. It doesn't mean He doesn't love us, it just is helping Him, allow, it's allowing us for him to see us and move us back in that direction. The Bible says that what? God disciplines those he loves. And we should thank him. The Bible also says for discipline. Because if not, we would be as illegitimate children. And he wouldn't care enough about us to even worry. But I'm so thankful that he does. And so we embrace that. We embrace that and we strive to be better. And so what is our heart? What is our motive? It must be love. Not puffed up. Uh, is another expression that, that we use uh, and you've seen in passages of scripture here. And then why do we brag? We brag for attention. We, we, a lot of us didn't have that or get that in our own times of formative years and so we're looking for that attention. We, we want to be affirmed and acknowledged and there's nothing wrong with us affirming and acknowledging each other. In fact, I was meeting with our leadership uh, this week and I told them we're not doing it enough. We need to do it more. But when that is our end all, then that's never going to be enough. That's a counterfeit from God being pleased with us and getting that time in prayer. And that way we're not seeking that out. That way if we don't get that, if we don't have that, we're okay. If we don't feel like we're being disserved when we prepare or we reach out to someone and we, we realize that something's happened. What did Jesus say about the seating at the table or James? also said this as well about we sit at the lower seats and they get asked to move up because if not we could be embarrassed and asked to be moved back those things in us the reason we brag and i know because I'm, i've been very good at it in the past in my life is because i didn't have that affirmation from my father but i can't use that as a crutch my heavenly father affirms me all the time if i let him and so I don't need to be doing this all the time. It, it's not natural to do that. You'll get a crick in your neck and in your arm doing that all the time. So it's important that we realize that we don't have to do that. God's going to take care of us. Our gift that he gives us, what does the Bible say? Will make a way for us. It, we're going to have an opportunity to serve him. We're going to know that he is pleased with us. And that has to be enough. And that's the humility. That's where humility comes in.
I understood the fact. This love, this agape love, is not rude. Okay, I think most of us can get a hold of that, right? But there are times that we are at least snippish, if nothing else, right? We get, I hear this all the time, in my own life, a tone. We get a tone that is different than the tone I've had before. And if I'm not careful, then that becomes unbecoming of me. It, pre it presents itself as something that is not of the Lord. And we know that happens sometimes, especially when my blood sugar is low and I'm hungry and things aren't going like I want them to. Teresa and I have decided we don't discuss heavy things about an hour before lunch. It is never a good idea. So our blood sugar is low, we're hungry, that flesh is wanting what it wants, and we just get in trouble. So sometimes when we've had a bad day, it's hard not to be rude. And it's important to realize that love is the only way that fixes this. Max Licato talks about grace in this way, but I want you to look at it in terms of love. That you have you you grown this flower from a seed, it's been sitting on your windowsill, you've been nurturing it and, and allowing it to grow, and then finally, after months of labor, you get this one big bloom, and it's beautiful, and you pin it on your lapel where everybody can see it, and as soon as you go out your door, the little old lady says, oh, that's pretty, and she plucks one of those off, then you go and your bus is late, and another one's plucked off, and you go through all through the day, and the nice thing you know, you're getting back to your house. You're about to open the door, you got one little flower on there, you're like, oh, I better not mess with this. And the little same little old lady comes back over and says, will you help me with my groceries? And pulls the last one off. And how do we feel when that happens, right? We all have bad days, right? Our cornflakes are soggy. They're out of Big Macs. They're out of Walking Meat at Burger King. Now, who runs out of Walking Meat at Burger King? But I have been there after a bad football game when we got big block of drum. Don't laugh back there, Mr. Chase. And... And spent all this money to go see them. And I go to Burger King trying to satisfy my, my solace with a good Whopper. And Burger King's out of Whopper. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> Shut the thing down. That's rude, right? That's rude, right? But what Max Cicado says, with God, it's like coming back into that room thinking you had that one flower and there's a bouquet in your windowsill. We've got to look at love that way. The reason we're having trouble giving love is we've stopped spending time enough with God to receive it. It's not our own love. It's not our own strength. It's not our own mind. We can't set in our hearts to do this scripture and go out even tomorrow and pull it off. It has to be God in us. It has to be that surrender. It has to be that infilling so I can go and not only give it away, but the Bible talks about in John 10, 10, that I can have a life that is overflowing. Jesus said, I have come that you have life abundantly. And the enemy comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. So the enemy's out every day to steal and kill and destroy the love that you are looking to give away. And it's important that we at least seek God first in the morning and say, Lord, I want to love today. I want to be more like you. I want to be more like Christ. I know I cannot do that in my own strength. So I surrender myself to you. I allow myself to be under you, Lord. You are Lord of my life so that that love can come out and be a part. And another way that the scripture is written, if you look at the original language, because again, that's the reason I'm doing the Amplified. It has so, so many more meanings. Is that it's not, um, it's not improperly. It doesn't behave improperly. Properly, meaning that when we're in a situation where people need to have etiquette and people need to have empathy or sympathy, that someone is not looking to take that situation over. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a funeral where you were just there, but funerals are interesting situations because you've got a lot of stress, you've got a lot of grief, and, and inevitably one family member is going to try to make that funeral about them and not about the person that's there. And if I've been to your family and your funeral, I'm not singling anybody out. It's just what happens. And, and that's because that person has not been loved properly. That's because that person doesn't understand how much God loves them. And they don't understand that that day should be for them. And if I know you well enough, I'm going to pull you aside in love. And we're going to talk about that. So that we get that and we understand that and know that. Because I love you enough to talk to you about it. I hope you will receive that. And I all do. But I've got to make sure I have the right attitude and I'm not rude and I'm not arrogant and I'm not coming from a point.
want a be like me because in my own situation I could easily be that way when I've been through a lot and I'm, I'm down on my last leg and I got one little pedal left it's important that we realize that we behave properly in all situations and the way that we do that is when you don't know how to behave and you don't know what to say is just be quiet and think about love <laughs> think about God's love literally recently I did a bit my thumb. You can't talk when you bite your thumb. And I didn't bite it until the blood came out, but I'm like, this will work. <laughs> and it did. Because I really wanted to say something, right? And I'm, like, I'm going to bite it. I'm just going to bite it. And I didn't bite it hard, but I put it where it couldn't talk. And it's important. Why? Because James says what about this? It's unruly. Man, it can get us in trouble. And when you, don't, when you haven't prayed about it, and you haven't thought about it, and you haven't worked through it, you just need to hold it for a second. So that it's not going to be rude. And it doesn't interrupt. Think about that. How many times have we been in a situation where someone would come into a conversation and interrupt? And the reason they were interrupting, again, think about this church. That's what was happening. Somebody would be teaching, somebody would be sharing God's word, and all of a sudden somebody would think they had a revelation, they would get up and interrupt and Paul is addressing this. Paul says love's not rude that way. Paul, Paul says there's a timing of this. There's an importance of that. You can't be impulsive all the time. You can't just think your needs are more important to come in and dominate a conversation while you're already having a conversation with someone else. Because we don't know what's going on in that conversation sometimes. It's important, to, especially when we're walking up in a church setting where God's been working, that you kind of look at the faces of the people. You, you kind of discern what kind of conversation is happening because God may be working and doing something. And the next thing you know, you're going to come in and, and want to say or want to do, and you may interrupt what God is doing. And again, I'm not singling anyone out. I'm just talking to us so we can be more aware of what God wants to do in us and how he wants to do it. So it behaves properly. Love does not interrupt. It's not about self-promotion. And it doesn't get in its own way. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to help us. And just being more disciplined and praying and asking God to show us when we're not doing that, that evaluation that I've been talking about at night, helps us do that. And God disciplines those He's loved. I've already got those He loves. I've already said that. One of the uh, commentaries I read said it this way. I love it. Love does not elbow its way into conversations, worship services, or other people's business. That's good. I like that. Love doesn't do that. It allows itself to be available. It lends itself as a listening ear. It is there to serve, right? Jesus served his disciples. The last act he did at the Last Supper was about serving them. He was helping them see what he came to promote. And he said, now that I've done this to you, do it for each other. So what's the opposite of rude? Polite. We want to be polite. We want to be kind. We want to allow those things in our own life to be what God's called us to be and open up and say, excuse me, or could I, or come back at a later time and say, hey, you know, I noticed that you were kind of troubled. I want you to know that I'm not crying by any means, but I want you to know I prayed for you when I saw that. And if you want to talk at any time, I want you to know that I'll be a safe place. And the only way I can prove that to you is prove it to you. And again, you won't hear anything from me anymore about this if you don't want to talk, but I'm going to pray. And just leave it at that. That way, you've left an open door for them. You pray for them till you see God allow them in a new season where they do have joy. And we're not looking for that own attention. As I told you before, God said when I moved here, it's so easy as God begins to use you. And this is my Wednesday night crowd on spring break. Okay, y'all are dedicated. Hey, y'all are here. Times change. You could be cutting the grass. You could be doing anything. Fishing. It's spring break. It would have been easy to stay home tonight. So I know I'm talking to you that God's, God's going to use you. You're dedicated. You're, you're looking to be used. You're looking to learn. When he uses you, it's amazing to have somebody need you. It's amazing to have somebody want to depend on you, and that's important so you can help them along their way. But if they become dependent on you always, then you're enabling them and not empowering them. And then all of a sudden, you're not teaching them to be a well digger, you're teaching them to drink from your well. And if you're not careful, you will become God to them. I've lived through this before I moved here. I've had I've struggled with it since I got here. I love it to be needed. I like it, but hey, just get a few 
dozen people that need you, and you won't want anybody to need you. you you'll be looking for a hole to crawl into, praying for the rapture to come. But it's important to realize that the church's role is to what? Equip the saints. So as people begin to heal and they begin to grow and they begin to move forward, your role is to help them to Jesus. Jesus is going to fix them. You're not. And he is going to equip them. And your role is to help them learn the ways of Christ so that they can move forward. So it's important that we realize that if we're self-promoting and we need that attention, then we're never going to make that shift. Because if we're not careful, we're, we're leading this group of people. And yes, we're helping them, but they talk to us more than they talk to God. And if that's happening, then we're doing it the wrong way. Does that make sense to everybody in here? It's easy to kind of get off sometimes and think, well, I'm going to call a pastor. I'm going to call a friend. I'm going to get them to pray. But we need to pray first. And then also we need to teach people to do that. Say, hey, have you prayed yet? Can we pray together? Let's pray about this now. And, and then just walk them through that process. Because the church at Corinth had got, not gotten to where they weren't about relationships. There was no relationship in this body of believers. They weren't waiting on each other to have the Lord's Supper. It was first come, first serve. It had turned into this big drunken party. Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians 11 and said, that's why some of you are sick. You defamed the sacrament. You defamed the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You guys have just gotten off track. There's interruption here. There's, there's all these things. And you wonder why people have these coverings over their heads sometimes. Because Paul said in this, to this church, you should, ladies, you just need to have your head covered in church. And people think that's across the board. But you can go back and research that. These ladies were coming very ornate and they were trying to outdo each other in how they looked. And he said, Paul, Paul, like a man, said, you know what? All y'all just cover your head. Just cover your head when you come here. And so we wonder why people feel that way. And I'm not knocking those people who are devout and feel their head or need to be covered and they're holy. That's between them and the Lord. But I'm saying that when church becomes about what we look like, and it can, right? It can become more about seeing our friends and other things than, than just really worshiping the Lord, then we get in trouble that way. And, and so we've got love allows that presence of God, allows us to be mindful of who He is. When His presence comes into this place and He comes into this room, we're, we, we are humbled by that. We're, we're overcome by that love. And that helps us stay focused on why this is. Because if not, if relationships aren't first, relationship with God, relationship with us, and relationship with others, then all of a sudden ministry can't happen without relationship. Does that make sense to everybody? You can get a one-time word, but that's not going to help you long term. God wants relationships. What did Jesus do with the disciples? He built relationships. He allowed them to see them more often. That's why we're going to take some time in the summer and Wednesday nights are going to be about relationships. We're going to get to know each other better in a different setting. And so when that happens, we're able to do ministry. True ministry with the Lord. No ministry could get done because they were trying to outdo each other. They were also, as I've already said, interrupting the speakers and um, trying to draw attention to themselves, self-centeredness. It's important that we, might, we pray before we come when we gather together. It's so amazing. You heard me say Sunday morning how much I've enjoyed getting back to having my own time of worship before I come here and worship and it's actually had the opposite effect that I thought. I'm just so much more primed and ready for worship because I've been doing my own worship in my own time. And I, I'm going to do more of that during the week because I just need that time. I'm a worshiper by nature. I love to worship the Lord. I, once I finally broke that, that facade that a man can't worship God openly and freely and raise his hands, the freedom came. And I need to do more of that on my own because if I'm only getting that when we're together, then that's not going to be enough, right? I'm just getting, I'm drinking from somebody else's well, really, you know, because somebody else came in here like Mary and they just gave themselves and the alabaster box, the fragrance filled the room. But when, I, when I've already prayed and I've already asked the Lord to make this service about you and I've prayed for the speaker, I've prayed for the singers, I've prayed for his will to be done, then I come in looking for what my part is going to be. I'm going to worship, no doubt. That's what I'm here for. But I might have a part where I might could love somebody. I might give somebody a pat on the shoulder. I might give them a, 
a kind word, I might give them a smile, so that love seeks to serve and not be served. I've already said that to you. Jesus represented that on the night that he gave himself up. And that makes church what it should be to meet the needs of the people. And that way, we're not worried about our needs getting met. We know that God's going to meet our needs. We come in with confidence that our needs will be met, that our prayers are going to be heard, and then we move forward. Because when church becomes self-seeking only, and when your marriage becomes self-seeking only, then that's not love. You're, you're beginning to see the counterfeit. What steals, kills, and destroys less, right? So we have to love. This love seeks to give first, not get. It always seeks to serve, not be served. And so it's important that we have that love during the week. That we're, it's not provoked. It's not, as I just read, it's not easily angered. It's able, it's able to withstand the agitation that comes. Uh, as we often know that being in a body of believers, being in a family, agitation is going to come. If you've had a brother or sister, you know agitation is going to come. In a family, he's looking at me. He's looking at me. He's, he's, his, he's close. His hairs are touching my hairs on my arm. My sister and I just have this argument. So when we're together and we're doing a lot of stuff together and we're going to be doing even more together, the enemy's going to try to get us where we're not in unity. Because when you read the New Testament, when the church is in unity, there's a lot of miracles happening. There's a lot of stuff going on that's powerful for God. So the enemy tries to keep us out of unity. So it's important that we're not easily offended. It's important that we're not, as the old folks used to say, wearing our feelings on our nose. And the only reason that people do that is because they're not, they've not got enough of God's love in them yet to be confident that people are not out to hurt them. And hurting people hurt people. I'm not here to belittle anybody who gets offended. But someone easily offended is going to get offended in the body of Christ. Because the enemy is going to point to something that's probably not even going to be really what it was. But if you're looking for it, he's going to show it to you. He's what? The master liar and deceiver. All right, you ever had an argument with somebody you loved? And all of a sudden you told them, you said blah, 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 blah. And they said, no, I did not. Well, who do you think said it? Then? The devil said it. If they didn't say it, right? I may only have to my hands on my own. <laughs> so when those things begin to happen, you have to realize who you're fighting against. You have to realize that the enemy comes to separate, divide, and conquer. He wants to pull us away from the flock. He wants to get us apart so he can destroy us. And we should do everything we have, can to keep the peace, to love the way that we're called to be loved, and also to not be tempted to argue or make a point or defend ourselves. That's in our marriages too. You know, we always say, is this a hill I really want to die on? You should not be dying on a bunch of hills. You should, you should try your best to work through things and make that happen. There are times that you're going to have to agree to disagree. That's important. God, God makes us that way. But believe there loving one another the same that you loved before. We live in a society right now that believes that if we can't agree, then we don't love each other, right? But if you disagree with me, you're, that's hate speech. That's, that's, that's kind of the culture that's coming up. And I don't want anybody to disagree with me. I don't want anybody to challenge me. I'm going to delete them all off my page. I'm going to just get people that rah-rah me on and my, my own self-promotion. And that's who I'm going to have as my, my peeps and my little entourage. And the next thing you know, we're all having these little churches of self everywhere. And we've forgotten about who we really serve and that we're called to serve one another. And again, we can't be overly sensitive or offended. That's going to happen. We're going to do things not even on purpose that are going to get people where we're off with each other. But that's important when we come together. Someone who's full of God's love can overcome being easily offended because they're getting what they need from the Father. All right, let's look at the last part of that verse. It keeps no record of offense. Woo! Anybody been married for a while in here? <laughs> it keeps no record of offense. Do you remember when, blah, 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 any family that's been together for any length of time has history. And if that history is not dealt with in the way that it should have been proper, and there's a proper way to do it, We'll talk to you about it here in just a second. We're getting close to closing, and then I make them all tonight. There's a proper way to do that. But if it's not dealt with properly, it comes back up. It comes back up over and over and over. 
And it's because that that person doesn't feel that they've been vindicated that brings it back up. Or they feel that that person is still who they used to be and they've really not repented and changed. And so that's why these arguments happen. But what should we do before we keep those records of wrongs? First of all, we have to take them to the Lord. We should take all of our offenses to God. We should take all of our trespasses. Remember what we learned a few weeks ago when we were studying the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer. The Lord reminded me, he said, you're not giving me those trespasses that have come against you. You're just thinking you should just lump this up and move on, that that just goes with the territory. But it's affecting who you are. It's hardening your heart. And so we have to go and give those things to God and talk to Him about them first. Then we begin to pray for that person that's offended us. We begin to pray and make sure that we're seeing it properly. It could be the enemy has twisted it and it's something that doesn't need to be brought up. We could be being easily offended and so we pray through it. But if it's still there and it's still nagging, then we need to go to that person and try to work it out. If we feel after time that it's still not worked out, we bring somebody with us. But the goal is that it's going to get worked out. And with God, it will get worked out. Amen. So that's how we keep unity among us. That's how we keep unity in the body. Most of because we don't deal with those offenses correctly is why those continue to there. That, that wound never got healed up. That, that old hurt never got healed up. Some of us have been wounded in other relationships. And we take those relationships into our new relationships. Some of us have been wounded by our own parents and we take on and we re represent that and we swore we would never do that. But it's because those soul ties, it's because those deep hurts, it's because those wounds have not been laid up on the altar like they should have been. And just God dealt with them and say, God, I'm hurt and I'm broken. And when that happened, I don't even know where you were. I need you to show me where you were in that moment. And until you do that, you're not going to get that deep healing that you need. But once you get that deep healing, you will not hold somebody else accountable for somebody else's hurt. And you'll be able to forgive people that even wronged you and justifiably should pay for it. But you've given it to God and let's let God do the judging. And that freedom is something that I want you to experience. That freedom allows you to be a healthy member in God's family. And allows you to go forward because you can't really live until you let that go, guys. We can't really move forward and we have to help other people through that. When you hear somebody talking over and over about what happened to them in that offense, it's our role as brothers and sisters in Christ to help them move through that process. God is enough to help them get through that. So we'll not be easily angry. And they won't either. Alright, let's look at six quickly. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices with the truth when right and truth prevail. So that's basically saying that anything that is unrighteous, we're not rejoicing over it. And a couple of things right here. One, we don't rejoice, most of us, when we see unrighteousness or tragedy, when babies' lives are being taken or there's so much strife in the world. But also, Paul dealing with this church, he was addressing something that, that once people began to move forward and they're getting freedom from certain things, they begin to judge other people for doing those same things. And so they're quick to want to rejoice when I can show you something here. Let me, let me show you something here. It's a long story, so I won't bear you with it tonight. But I remember having God wear me out about dipping snuff and being an example. I was fixing to go on a youth trip as a chaperone. I didn't want those boys to see me doing that. I tried to have the little packets that didn't leave the grains in my teeth. And they were boys, they were middle schoolers. And by about the third day on the trip, I'm in there just sucking that thing dry in the bathroom because I needed, needed something to coat. And God said, you ready to quit that? And I said, yeah, I'm ready to quit. And I quit. But I remember right after that, everybody that had a ring, everybody, look at them, just bam, just bam. It's amazing how quick. We begin to judge people when we've got freedom from something. And that's what Paul was addressing in this church. I am going to shepherd a church. God has told me this, so I'm just sharing it with you. I'm going to shepherd a church where people are going to come in and they're going to smell like smoke. They were that close to heaven. And that, that, that he, he actually said that over me one time when somebody was praying over me, and I, I believe that. And so these people are going to have issues. And these people are going to get free from that. Aren't we going to rejoice and we're going to get excited? But those same people are going to be care they're going to run into that snare of being judgmental. And we've got to help them through that. And then we have to be there. Okay? Because they may have a bunch of things going on when they come in. 
But love is going to change that. Love is going to come in from the inside out. Love's going to affect the inside, and the outside can't help but line up with the inside when that happens. And so it's important that we rejoice with that when that happens. We rejoice with righteousness. We set the standard. We live by example. And what true love doesn't compromise its standards. But it rejoices with the truth when it comes out. And this church needed to get back to that. They had a superiority problem about, you know, these things are here and that's there. And, and you, I'm going to point this out to you because I see this happening. And that only creates a problem. Um, there's an example given in the Word of God by, uh, not in the Word of God, but in a story that I've heard. I apologize for that. It's a story, kind of a joke, about two preachers that they were going to preach on hell. A young preacher and an old preacher. And the young preacher said, I want to go first. He said, all right, what service do you want? He said, I want Sunday morning. He said, okay. So he got up there and he preached it hot. He preached hell was hot. He let them just give it to him. The altar, no one came. That night, the older seasoned pastor preached on hell, the altar was full. And the young pastor comes to him and says, what happened? Why is the difference? He said, this morning, son, you preached like you wanted him to go. And tonight, I preached like I was saving him, trying my best to reach out, that I didn't want to go, that I wanted to put myself in the way. And there's a difference there. There's a difference in how we treat people out there in the world. There's a difference in how we treat them when they come in here. And it's important. We have standards. But there's things that we cannot do because this is a safe place for our children. Don't get me wrong tonight. and Don't twist my words even. I want you to understand, though, when we start reaching people that are out there, they're going to act like they've been out there until God works through them and works on mighty work. But true love rejoices with the truth. It's the gospel. That we worship God in spirit and in truth. That we worship Him with nothing to hide. We embrace the truth with love. It may hurt, but it's the ultimate way to heal. We're going to look at John 4 on Sunday. Jesus said that those that worship the Father worship in spirit and what? Truth. We want God to be truthful with us. And we want to be truthful with those that we care with long enough. People don't care how much we know to what, you know, how much we care. Those people who we have labored with and loved with, we have to tell them the truth. I've heard this said, love is the sugar to the medicine of the truth that helps it go down and stay. And that's true. I rejoice in it when it happens and it convicts me. I rejoice in it when it helps someone else move forward. I rejoice. It takes no pleasure in someone's failure, but rejoices and encourages when they turn and pursue the truth. All right, I think we can get set. I won't keep you past 10 after I promise. We're almost done. Seven's not long. Hope's all things. We've already talked about that. I'm sorry. Dan was like, no, that's not. Love bears all things. Think about that. Long suffering. We've already talked about that. So when you have something in your life that you can't bear, where do you go? You go to God's love. Because it's going to bear. It can bear the unbearable. That's why we get through the day. That's how we know we can make it through tomorrow, step by step. How? Because I'm giving it to God. God loves me. That's what you should declare over your life every day. God loves me. How do I know God loves me? Because he gave his son to die for me on the cross. There's no doubt that God loves me. And therefore, I can bear all things because he's going to bear them for me through his love. I love the effort right here. Regardless of what comes, love can handle it. There's no telling what some of you have been through or what you've had to endure. But hear the truth. Love can take it. Love can bear it. And love can heal the hurt. Love never tires of support. It believes the best in us all. Believes all things. It believes the best in everyone. Wouldn't gossip man have a hard hit if we believed the best in one another? Man, it would just, it would just take this huge blow if we just believed a good report before we would believe a bad one. That we would go and talk to that person. That we just believe the best in one another. Because why? Because God lives in us. And therefore we're all working toward good and for help and for hope. Man, it's a time that we can move forward and keep the faith. Love beams with hope in all things. It beams with hope. Faith, hope, and love. That's what we talk about. Holding the line even in difficult times. Stay optimistic and positive and comforting. That's hard to do. It takes God's love to do that. 
Spouses have to do this for each other. I'm rarely down when Teresa's down. There is an opposite effect. We pick each other up. We're made to be that way for one another. That's what love does. And we have to be able to do that for one another. Love will endure. The greatest of these is love, we read. This kind of love will endure. It does not weaken. It has to face the ultimate test. And that is the cross. And I had time tonight, and maybe we'll start there next week and just kind of review this again in the New American Standard and just look at every one of these were born out on the cross. If you look at Jesus from the time that he is in trial of Pilate until he gives his life, he gives all of this. All of this comes to pass in play. Jesus has been through everything already. All we have to do is give it to him and allow him in us to see us through. Amen? Because why? What does it say? And eight, love never fails. That's the promise all of us can hang on to. And if I want to keep somebody from failing, if I want to help somebody up and not keep a hand on them and push them down, then I need to love them. Love is accountability. Love is those things that we want to help each other. We're telling the truth because we help each other. But love is first and foremost about service. We love others because God has first loved us. Amen? So this type of love cannot fail. I'm just going to read my closing here to you. This type of love will not fail. This is the love we're called to. The love that God is longing to fill us with. To the point of overflowing, this love will take us beyond. Do you want to go beyond? Abundantly beyond. I do. Let's determine that with the grace of God that we will go beyond and we will love each other as Christ has first loved us. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that the people in this room would feel your love, first and foremost. That your Holy Spirit would help each and every relationship that may be strained tonight. That you would begin to show us those places that you need to heal, those deep wounds and soul hurts in us, so that we can adequately love others. And Lord, for those that are hard to love, may we begin to pray for them more. And Lord, I pray that this would be a fountain of love. I pray that this place would be like a well-watered garden and a sun scorched land. And I pray for my own life, Lord. Lord, I, I feel very inadequate to teach and preach this kind of love because I fail in it often. But Lord, hear my heart tonight. I desire to do it. I desire to be better. I desire to do better. I desire to lead by example. And I desire for us to win people to you by the way we love each other, by the way we love those that are hard to love, and by the way that we serve each other in this community, God. So, Lord, spur us on to new, great, creative acts of love. Allow your love to be felt by every person in this place tonight. Facebook's off tonight. If you haven't felt the Lord's love in a while, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody's looking, this is not on media, just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, you see these that are looking and wanting and reaching out for your grace and your love and your mighty presence tonight. Lord, I thank you that you're a good God.